I'd like to say welcome to the eighth series in the SAR Speaking Out About History series. I am Brooks Lyles. I'm the Historian General of the National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, and I'm the moderator for our series. So I'm not going to go into a long introduction, but for our SAR audiences, this is a change from our normal procedure in the Speaking Out About History series. Rob Skeed is the author of several historic and popular children's books. There are three outstanding books in his Revolutionary War series, which follow the adventures of identical twin brothers, Ambrose and John Clark, the sons of the Culper spy ring, and a member Lambert and Clark. Today's interview is about the first book in the series, Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies. I highly recommend all three, including Submarine Secrets and a Daring Rescue about David Bushnell's submarine, The Turtle, and Links to Liberty about defending the great chain at West Point, New York. My grandson, Shane, will definitely be receiving all three uh, in his Christmas package this year. Um, one of the things in this series is that Rob collaborated with his father, who's also a compatriot of the SAR, uh, in developing the stories. Uh, and the one difference in our normal process in, view, in interviewing authors is that the questions normally come from our compatriots, from the SAR membership. Today, our questions come from Rowlett, Texas, and the Cullens Lake Point fifth graders of Ms. Gail Kidd. Uh, Ms. Kidd who was the 2022 winner of the Dr. Tom and Betty Lawrence American History Teacher of the Year Award. I'll introduce Rob. He'll have a couple of minutes to talk about the books, about his writing process, and then we will get to, uh, to your questions. So, Rob, the floor is yours. All right, great. Well, hi, boys and girls. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me doing, doing this Zoom author visit with your, with your class, and thank you for reading my story. Um, it was a fun, fun story to write. And it's probably my favorite book that I've written to date. And people always ask me, why would it be your favorite? And the honest answer is because I got to do it with my dad. And if you talk about a father-son fishing trip being a great experience, writing a book with your dad is a whole lot more fun. And I like to think of it as that, like it's on steroids as far as a relationship building. So on behalf of my dad, I want to thank you as well for, uh, for reading our story and uh, for hopefully loving it. Now, as far as my writing process is concerned, you know, writing a book with your dad, you know, you can't both be at the computer at the same time. So we do a lot of the story creation together. And we do that by meeting together, you know, at a kitchen or dining room table and talking about it. Then we actually do a lot of emailing back and forth. My dad helped a lot with the research in the story using Google um, and history books. And then when it comes down to the actual writing, I do the first draft and um, then pass it off to my dad, and we collaborate via email working in the Word document together. So that's kind of how our, our writing process has worked to date. And um, we did that with Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies, the sequel, Submarines, Secrets, and a Daring Rescue, and then the third book, which launched last October um, 2021, Links to Liberty, Defending the Great Chain at West Point. And our goal with these stories is to take little known elements of history, put an adventure around them, and use them as hooks to hopefully give kids a great read and also give kids an opportunity to learn something about the American Revolution that maybe they wouldn't learn in the classroom setting. So for example, I was in sixth grade in 1976 during our nation's bicentennial, and I never learned about their Culper spying. I never knew about the American turtle submarine or even the great chain at West Point. And at that time, um, in the classroom and throughout our nation and during the bicentennial, everything was about the American Revolution. So when I became an adult and had this love for history instilled by my dad and started researching more and discovered these facts, I knew I needed to do something to share them more with kids so they could learn about them too. All right. Thank you, Rob. So let's get into the, uh, the questions. Uh, and again, all of these questions are from you, the students of, uh, of Miss uh, Kidd's class. So our first question up is, what inspired you to write the book? And this was submitted by Riley. Yeah. Hi, Riley. Thank you for your question. Um, what inspired me to write this book? Well, that's an interesting story because it started with my father becoming a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. 
So my dad and my sister did our genealogy. We found out that we had a, a relative, an ancestor, who served in the American Revolution for the Continental Army in the Connecticut, the state of Connecticut militia. And so my dad joined the Sons of the American Revolution. He got a really cool certificate um, as a member. And then one day he invited me over to his house to show me the certificate. And he said, well, now you can become a member as well. And so I said, dad, that's really cool that you did that. And I said, by the way, when I visited this local historical home two towns away with my family, I got an idea for a story um, about the American Revolution that involved kids. And so I told my dad that little kind of 30 second synopsis of the story. And uh, he said, that's a really cool idea. How come you never wrote it? And I said, well, I guess I never made time. And I thought that was the end of the story, but it wasn't because a few days later I had, I received an email from my father and my dad took that little nugget of a story and created what we would call a treatment. It was about 12 pages long. It was a story from beginning, middle to end. It had the characters, what they would experience, the conflict that they would um, experience as well. And I said to myself, how did my dad do that? I was the writer in the family. And then I remembered my dad was in his 80s at the time, and he had 70 plus years of reading behind him. And typically the best writers are also the voracious readers. So I'm like, ah, oh, that must be how my dad did that. So just for fun, I banged out the first scene of that treatment in a book format in a Word document, and I emailed it to my dad. And just like you boys and girls, when we do something, we're excited for our teachers or our parents to respond to it and hopefully like what we do. Um, I called my dad. I said, go check your email. And then I waited impatiently for him to call me back about 20 minutes later. And he called me back and he said, that was fantastic. And then he said two words that really freaked me out. He said, keep going. I was like, oh, wow, keep going. That means that means he wants to keep going, right? I got to keep writing this story further. And that's what we did. Day after day, week after week, scene by scene, my dad and I collaborated together with his ideas and some ideas of my own. And we wrote what became the first draft of Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies. Uh, that's, that's very cool. All right, our next question comes from Alina. And she asks, how did you decide to develop the character's traits? Hi, Lena, and thank you for your question. So how did I decide to write the character's traits? So we knew that the two main characters would be the twin boys, Ambrose and John Clark. We knew they're going to be 14 years old. And when you're creating a, a character, or have actually, we have two almost main characters, right, in this story. So when you're creating characters, what, what makes a story interesting is if there's a lot of conflict. So the boys couldn't be very similar. So to create the conflict, I had to make the boys different. And um, so one was kind of serious, one had more of a sense of humor. Also one believed in the cause and one wasn't quite so sure that liberty was worth dying for. And uh, so really that's what made the differences in the characters is just as an element to create conflict to make the story an interesting read. All right, and that ties uh, directly into our next question also from Riley, which is why did you make the twins so different at the beginning of the story? Yeah, so kind of like I just said, Riley, um, to make the twins different was just a matter of um, making them, uh, their personalities had to be different, right? Because they were they looked exactly the same. So we had to have a, had to have a vehicle. So when they're interacting with other characters, they could kind of tell them apart, um, but also just to create conflict and drive the story forward that way. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from Sydney. Uh, she asks, how long did it take to write the book? Uh, hi, Sydney, and thank you for your question. So the first draft of the story took about 12 weeks to create. Now, you have to keep in mind, that's a first draft. And boys and girls, if you read any first draft of any story that I wrote, you know what you'd say to yourselves? That Mr. Skeed is not very good at writing. But because I go back and do things over and over and over again, each time it gets better and better and better. And the same thing is true for, for your work, whether it's working on a, a story or a math problem or even practicing a sport, right? Every time we go back and do something over and over and over again, it gets better and better and better to the point where hopefully at the end, we have something we're proud of and other people get to enjoy as well. So my dad wrote the story and my dad and I wrote the story in about 12 weeks. But then we had to start the rewriting process. And so we went through one draft, two drafts, three drafts, making it better. Again, collaborating uh, along the way. 
Then we actually give it to other people to read and get their feedback. And then ultimately when it goes to a publishing house for it to become a book, the editors there are like our teachers and they um, edit it and make it better as well. And so typically there's about three rounds of edits that you do with a professional editor at a publishing house. So nothing is ever done when you think it is. And in the process, the good news is that it keeps getting better. Very good. Uh, our next question uh, is a combination of two, uh, one from, uh, from Sincere and Jaden. Uh, and their question is, where did you get the names for the characters? Ah. Were they actual names or did they come from somewhere else? Yeah, well, thank you, Sincere and Jaden, for the question. And the names of the characters actually came from my father's ancestors who or ancestor who fought in the American Revolution, served the American Revolution, Lambert and Clark. Um, and my dad was excited about um, Lamberton because he was in, line in the lineage of my dad's favorite grandfather, whose last name was also Clark. And so Lamberton had eight kids and two of them were named Ambrose and John. And I really love the name Ambrose because that's not a name you typically hear nowadays. And so I knew that had to be one of the names for the characters as well as my dad. And then John is my middle name and my son's name. So that was a good um, name to choose as well. Now, whereas my son, John, is a class clown and a comedian, um, I chose the John character to actually be the serious one in this story. Uh, very good. All right. So those questions address uh, writing books and getting books published. How, are, how do you go through the process? So let's get into the uh, questions that are uh, specific to the, um, the book itself, and we they're organized by chapters. So we're going to start with chapter one and, and work our way down from there. So the first question from chapter one is, are the boys fictional characters or real twins? And that comes from Ruby. Okay. So hi, Ruby, and thank you for your question. So the boys are actually fictional characters in the sense that the real John and Ambrose Clark, you know, weren't uh, given a spy letter from their dad to accomplish a special secret mission for General George Washington. Um, John and Ambrose Clark actually did live and exist, um, but they were not involved uh, in that aspect of the American Revolution. Okay, uh, this would sort of be, uh, this question comes from Vanessa, and it is, sort of into the prequel for the, uh, for the series. But the question is, when did the dad become a spy? Okay, so hi, Vanessa. Thank you for that question. That is a question um, that is kind of the subtext behind the, the backstory behind the, old, the whole series, right? And so Lamberton Clark um, became a spy um, because of his friendship with Benjamin Talmadge, who created the Culper spy ring. So that's kind of the, the backstory of it. It's not really told so much in the book. Um, in the sequel, Submarine Secrets and a Daring Rescue, we hear more about Benjamin Talmadge's relationship with the family. And, um, but really, as you may recall from the story, the real, the real question is who gave away their dad's secret mission that ended up, ended up causing him to be shot by the two Redcoats? And that question gets answered in book three, Links to Liberty, Defending the Great Chain at West Point. And boys and girls, I have to tell you that my dad came up with the idea of how that happened. And when he sent me the treatment um, for the third story and I read his idea, I was, I was blown away. And I thought it was so brilliant. It was so creative. And again, I said to myself, how did my dad, how does he come up with this stuff? And um, I hope when you get to read Links to Liberty, Defending the Great Chain at West Point, that you'll be blown away as well as to how that really happened in the story. All right, very good. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to that, that book myself. Um, next question comes from uh, Sincere. Why did the author make the twins opposite one being optimistic and the other being pessimistic. Yeah, thank you for that question, Sincere. 
So yeah, we had to be able to tell the boys one from each other because they're in almost every scene with each other, right? Um, so to make one pessimistic and one optimistic was just another way of being able to tell them apart um, when you're creating you know, action and dialogue um, and everybody's got a different personality, right? Even though twins look exactly alike, they still never have personalities that are exactly alike. They're always uh, very different. So that was just one reason we did that for that um, aspect of the boy's character. And I did do some research with some twins that I know who are identical. And um, I gave the manuscript when it was first written to these twins that I know. Um, they were older gentlemen, They'd obviously been twins their whole life. And I said, you gotta let me know what works, what doesn't work. You know, I'm happy to change anything that's, you know, that doesn't work. And he came back to me after reading the manuscript and he said, wow. He said, you've got some imagination because you know you nailed every aspect of what it, what it's like for me and my brother to be identical twins and interact with people and what they say to us and what they joke around about with us. So I was very pleased with that. So um, you know our imaginations can come up with great things sometimes. All right, very good. Uh, our next question comes from Erin, and it is, "Who is Nathan Hale? What happened to him, and what did he do?" Ah, well, that's a great question. And thank you so much for that. Um, so Nathan Hale was America's and the American Revolution's first spy. Now, he was a, a teacher um, and he graduated from Yale and then he became a teacher. And he volunteered to go into um, New York and spy on the British, but he had absolutely no training. And um, legend has it that when he was on his way back, um, home with his spy information that somebody who knows him, maybe even a family member, told the British about him. So he was caught and captured um, by the British. Uh, they found some of the information that he had obtained in New York on him that he was going to share with General Washington. And unfortunately, they hung him on a tree as a kind of example um, to others to you know not go against the British. And his famous line is, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. So General Washington was so upset that Nathan Hale got caught and uh, captured and, and hung that he wanted to make sure that all his future spies, um, that their identities remained anonymous. And that was part of the foundational principles for what became the Culper Spiring. All right. Well, thank you, Erilyn. Uh, and thank you, Rob. Our next question, we're jumping up ahead to chapter five. This question comes from Peyton. And Peyton wants to know, when you were describing the horses in chapter five with their dialogue, what was the meaning? Uh, hey, Peyton, how are you? Um, so when I was describing the horses in chapter five, and that's when I believe they were stealing the horses, um, there really was no uh, great meaning behind you know, their explanation there. Um, I was just describing the horses, what they looked like. I made them to be identical twins as well. Um, the horses looked exactly alike or very similar. And I just thought that'd be kind of a cute thing to add to it since the boys look alike, to have the horses look similar or look alike as well. And that might be another way that um, if need be in the future that people couldn't tell them apart. Yeah, I thought it was uh, interesting that, that one of the horses got named immediately as George. Right. Uh, and and the other horse uh, had to earn his name. It waited. It took a little longer to get there, but uh, eventually thunder was uh, bestowed upon him. Yep. Um, so that that was a nice a nice twist in there. Um, in chapter six, uh, Anna Lee wants to know uh, if you have a map of the route that the brothers took. Ah, you know what? That's a great question. Thank you, Anna Lee. Yes, there is a map of the route or route that the brothers took, and it's on my website, which is robertski.com. And if you click on the Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies page and then scroll down, you can actually see a map of the exact route <coughs> that the brothers took in the story. And that was something I asked my dad to create right when we started reading the story um, or started writing the story, I should say. So in our own minds, we can kind of keep track of what where they were going, what they were doing, and where exactly it was um, in, in Fairfield, Connecticut area, and then New York, and then ultimately in New Jersey. So it's a really cool map. 
Um, I actually have the uh, original um, here in my home office, and at some point I intend on framing it. Uh, that's cool. So I, I know in your research that Lamberton served in the Connecticut militia. Yep. Uh, and a lot of your interactions uh, in the series are with Connecticut militiamen. Um, have you been up there and walked the ground? Do you, do you Have you reconned the areas that you're writing about? I have not. You know, Connecticut's only the next state away, but I have not reconned uh, the state of Connecticut area that the militia might have been in. Um, I have been to West Point, where the Great Chain was, um, and got to use, you know, my imagination there. Um, I have been to different homes that are historical homes in New Jersey here that are uh, featured in Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies, and then also in Links to Liberty. Um, and I've done a lot of research online about the American Turtle submarine, as you could imagine. Well, on a sidebar, uh, the SAR Museum uh, that we're building in Louisville is going to have a, a model uh, wow. of the turtle in there. So when we get that, we'll be able to uh, actually come down, take a look at it. And, and uh, I believe it's going to be a cutaway. So you actually see the internal controls of the submarine and how uh, how Bushnell designed it and how it was operated. So that's great. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. All right. Uh, heading up to chapter seven, we have a question from Kinsey. Why were the British so mean? Ah, uh, Kinsey. Thank you for that question. Why were the British so mean? Boy, just like there's mean kids in your class or your school, I should say, probably not your class, but there's mean kids in your in your school. Um, unfortunately, there's mean people everywhere. And when they get grown ups, they become even meaner, especially in, a, in an atmosphere of war. Um, war is not pleasant uh, for anyone, whether you're on your home team or the visiting team, um, whether you're the enemy or not the enemy, um, war is awful. And I tried to get that theme across in Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies, and then the two sequels. Um, you know, there's bad things that happen in, in the books. There's knife fights, there's gunfights. Um, people get captured and, and also rescued. Um, and there's battles. And unfortunately, this is just an element of warfare. And it was kind of interesting to write about that in a kid's book series, right? Because you could, you know, you got to make them mean um, and believable, but you, you know, in real world, sometimes they're even meaner. Okay, next up, uh, jumping up ahead to chapter 11, we have a question from Kovana. How many events of the boys getting chased are true or false? Yeah, so thank you for that question. And they are all made up for the story. Um, it, well, it's historical fiction, you know, the history part is the lessons about the culprit spying, lessons about how spies actually operated, um, lessons about General Washington, and, you know, a lot of his dialogue came right out of letters that he wrote during that time period. Um, but the, the events of the boys themselves, um, from point A, when they get the spy letter from their dad, to the end, when they meet General Washington and get to present the letter to him, um, to the point where they go home and, and see their parents. Um, that's all, all made up in our imaginations. Um, and as part of creating a story is making sure that uh, things go wrong, right? So you want to take your main character, you want to get him into trouble, you want to get him into deeper trouble, and then provide even deeper trouble. And by doing that, you've set up a problem. And then all good stories end with a uh, solution to that problem and hopefully a happy ending. So that was kind of the format that we follow in our in our writing, and um, hopefully you got to enjoy and having a heart for the the boys and the, the twins. So when they do get into all that trouble, you feel for them and want them to succeed and want them to uh, have that happy ending as well. All right, very good. Um, chapter thirteen. Uh, moving on. Aiden asks. Why did you put bandits in this chapter? Uh, hi, Aiden, and thank you for that question. So that's actually one of my very favorite scenes in Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies is when the bandit um, steals the letter and they've got to get it back. And, um, and having that bandit, you know, kind of have a potty mouth and uh, th their reaction to, to cash, catching him and getting the, the letter back or the gun back 
Um, it was one of my favorite scenes to write and a lot of fun. Um, and why did I have it in there? Again, when you're writing a story, bad things have to happen to your characters so they can overcome them. And having the, the musket with the spy letter stolen as they're on the road to see General Washington just was another way to, to make that happen. And hopefully you guys enjoyed that scene as well. Uh, and relating to that theme, Christina would like to know if the thieves knew about the message. Yeah, hi, Christina. And no, the thieves didn't know about the message. They were just thieves and uh, bandits on the road and, um, and took the, the musket just because, you know, they could steal something. Okay. Uh, Odina wants to know what if the thief had looked in the musket and found the message? What would have happened? Yeah. Also, what would have happened if they had not made the trap or the snare? Sure. So hi, Odina, and thank you for that, for that question. Um, so if the thief or the bandit had looked into the musket and found the letter, he may or may not have known what he had because, uh, you know, as you know from the ending, it was just a love letter. The, the um, message, the spy message itself was written in an in invisible ink. Um, so he might've just been wondering, you know, what, why was it hidden inside a musket? And if the kids didn't uh, invent this or create the snare to catch the bad guy, um, they would have had to do something else, right? To catch the bad guy and get that musket back with the letter in it. So you guys can use your own imaginations and think of, you know, what you would do in that situation if you didn't um, have the, the creativity or the knowledge to create a snare. You know, it's one of the uh, interesting things about our ancestors and about people living in the uh, 18th and 17th centuries is that skill sets like building a snare uh, for, as used to capture game uh, would have been a skill set that a lot of people had. Yep. And one of those one of those things that would have been been passed down from father to son or from older brother to younger brother. So. When my wife and I do a lot of uh, sessions with schools and we come out in colonial clothing and we have uh, items that we, we show, it's called a traveling trunk. Um, when you talk to students, you talk to, to young folks, they don't, you know, they, their life has been lived in, the, in our modern times. Um, and when you look at leather and wool clothing or uh, eating utensils that are made out of uh, bone or horn, uh, it's hard to think uh, from all the things we have now in a world without plastic, a world without electricity, a world without uh, lights. So yeah, uh, snares, trapping, shooting, uh, the ability to hunt and ride are all things that everybody would have had to have to survive in those times. Yep. Yeah, very true. So that, that's a great thing about reading historical books and historical fiction is you learn um, how people before us uh, lived and survived. All right, our next question up is in chapter 16. Uh, and this comes from Ruth. How do they or people know what happened back then? Ah. Uh. Well, thank you, Ruth, for that question. And kind of like Brooks just said, you know, history books are a great, a great way for us to know what happened back then. Um, you know, we did a lot of research for these stories, um, even to figure out what the boys were going to eat on their journey, right? And originally, I had the boys eating tomatoes and then found out in our research, and actually somebody at West Point who read the story pointed this out to us, that they didn't eat tomatoes back then. They actually thought they were poisonous. And, um, and a lot of that also was because they were eating off plates that um, I guess had lead in them or something that made uh, people get sick when they ate tomatoes. So they actually thought tomatoes were poisonous back then. Um, so the way we know about life back in the day is, you know, either it comes down from generation to generation verbally um, or, you know, from our history books. Well, and, you know, Kids, you guys know about uh, the internet, you know about Facebook, you know about uh, TikTok and, and bloggers, people who write um, stories or write about their lives. Uh, back, in the, back in these times, people kept journals or they kept diaries. Yeah. 
So they would write about what was going on in their life. And as you research history and you're, you're researching for a book or you're researching your ancestry, uh, a lot of the information we find is based on what we call uh, primary source or first person history. So it's the, it's the diary of a, a young lady who, who kept a journal for the four years of the war, allows us to know what happened on Tuesday, you know, 17 April of, of this year or that year. So researchers and writers have to go out and find all of this stuff. And what you do when you get a project and you go to the library and you ask the librarian for help, and they may refer you to a book or to something else. That's sort of the same process. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of reading and a lot of research that goes into to writing a book. So what, what Rob and his father did, that's why it takes so long to uh, to go through all the revisions and to, to get that stuff put together. Uh, our next question, uh, also out of chapter 16, is what is a British frigate? Ah, British frigate. And if you go to um, Patriots, Redcoats, and Spies, there's a glossary in the back, right? So if you, boys and girls, if you have any um, questions about what different words mean, um, don't forget to look at the glossary in the back. And there's some historical biographies as well, I believe. And a British frigate is a British ship. So essentially a ship of war um, that the British would have used to go from Great Britain to the, to the colonies. And, you know, it had cannons on it. And that's what they used to to move their troops and move their supplies and, and fight other ships. Okay. Our last question, uh, and then we're gonna see what we'll do. We'll open up the floor probably and see if we have any additional questions or anything from Ms. Kidd. But our last question from the students that were submitted is from Vanessa from chapter 17. And she asks, why didn't General Washington laugh when Ambrose was juggling the peaches? Hi, Vanessa, and thank you for that question. You know, I, had a, I, I saw your question. These came to me beforehand, and I read that chapter over again to try to remember what was going through my own head when I, when I wrote that scene. And I actually thought it was funnier if here is Ambrose trying to make General Washington laugh, doing the best he can, and General Washington doesn't bust a smile or doesn't laugh. So, so to me, that was actually funnier than if he did crack up because um, Ambrose obviously thinks he's pretty funny. All right, well, guys, that gets us through uh, our full set of submitted questions. So I will ask Ms. Kidd if, um, if there are any additional questions that anybody in the audience would like to ask, or if you have any questions for, uh, for Mr. Skeed that, uh, that you would like to ask. Uh, the girl that they both liked. The girl that they both liked. Oh, Sophie, yeah. So yeah, I had to have, obviously I had to have a girl character in there, even if she's only mentioned. Um, she plays a bigger role in uh, the sequel, S Submarines, Secrets in a Daring Rescue and Links to Liberty. Um, you see more of her. But yeah, just another way to add conflict was to have the boys kind of like the same girl and one thinking that the girl likes um, him better than the other brother. So uh, just kind of an, another element of ways to have fun with it. Were there any difficulties in writing the book? Were there any difficulties in writing the book? Yeah, actually, writing um, isn't easy because I always say writing is rewriting. You can't get something perfect the very first time. At least I can't and my dad can't. So it's difficult because you have to go back and do it over again and, and keep making it better and better and better. And sometimes you take the story and you change things, you go in different directions, you know, dialogue changes, action changes. So it's a constant state of continuous improvement, which makes it difficult. But at the end, it's all worth it because like I said, it keeps getting better. And at the end, hopefully I had something I was proud of and that you get to enjoy, which I feel is the case. You should be very proud. You should be very proud of that. That was Thank very you. good. We, we were on the edge of our seats the whole time we were reading it, weren't we? Yeah. Thumbs up everybody, right? Yeah. Josh, okay, she's talking about Josh, the character that was the Patriot, but they really didn't know he was a Patriot. 
Yeah. So they weren't sure. And so why did you include him? And, you know, what maybe what made them trust him? Yeah. Yeah. So that was part of the, the rescue scene at the end, right? I had to bring him back from the beginning. And it was also a way, you know, when you're writing a story and, and, and you want it to be for kids and you have a scene at the beginning where they're, they're stealing horses, right? Mm -hmm. Stealing is wrong. And mm -hmm. um, so then how do you make that right? And so I had to have Joshua come back and then General Washington offer to uh, give them horses um, to kind of make the stealing work because um, stealing is wrong. But, you know, sometimes when you're have extenuating circumstances or serious circumstances, they had to do what they had to do to fulfill their mission. Right. But so I had to bring Joshua back for uh, to help make that happen. We did relate that to our own real world and why things like that happen in today's environment and how yeah. maybe it wasn't, it isn't always because people are wanting to do the wrong thing. It's out of, okay. Why did Ambrose get shot? What, what was the um, meaning with that part of the book? What was the lesson maybe that you were teaching? Yeah, I don't think there was any major lesson. Um, it was just, you know, kind of how I creatively had to make that scene work. To bring that, I think what he's telling us is to bring all the excitement and the adventure, which we felt and we got, right? Because we were always on the edge of our seats into this, the development of the story. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe one more. Okay, so when they were getting the blueberries, they were getting the blueberries and the one twin stayed back. Why didn't he just shoot the um, Patriot? I mean, the um, Redcoat. The was bad guy? Yeah, yeah that that's, that's a very good question. Yeah, so if I had him shoot it, that would end the story too soon. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we still had a ways to go. I so knew I maybe, um, let, me, let me talk a minute. Maybe if you could just talk to them a little bit about patriotism and why um, people were so passionate about what they were doing back then, um, just for a minute with them, because we really got that from the story, didn't we? About how everybody, all of the patriots were very out for the mission and they were almost fearless. Yeah. So, you know, and I'll okay. leave some time for Brooks to add some color to this as well. Um, but here, certainly in New Jersey, um, it was it was almost like a civil war. So you had patriots, right? And you had loyalists, people loyal to the king. You, you could be in the same family, the same town, and be on opposing sides and not know who to say or what to say to who or who you could trust. Um, there were militias that were always on call ready to fight the British. In New Jersey here, there were more skirmishes and in, in the state of New Jersey than any other colony. Um, so on the Patriot cause, you know, they were very, very passionate about wanting, you know, their liberty and their rights um, and to be free from British rule. There were others who didn't believe that was necessary. And so here in New Jersey, it was almost like a civil war in that respect. Um, like, like I said, you could be in the same family and have somebody with an opposing view. So it was, there was a lot of passion um, because of that. Yeah, and, and that's very true. It was a civil war uh, and it was a, a war between families in that the King of England uh, was the ruler of the empire and the colonies, the 13 colonies, and actually there were more than 13 in North America, because you had um, you had the British uh, Canadian or Canadian colonies. So it was a, a larger group, and they all looked at the king as being uh, a benevolent ruler who had their best interest in heart. And over the course of several years between the, the French and Indian War and the War of Independence, um, the colonies felt, the people, many of the people in the colonies felt that the king did not have their best interest at heart anymore. And the, you all have heard the phrase taxation without representation. Um, when that, uh, when the British start imposing taxes on the colonies, a lot of the colonists um, were, uh, were upset because they did not have a voice in the matter. It was the, what the king and, the, and England said. So they felt um, that they would be better off without 
the king as their ruler and that they were there was nobody better positioned than they were to rule themselves. So the, the 13 colonies decided that uh, they would try to resolve their differences with the king. And when that didn't work, they decided that they were going to separate from England and become their own country. And that's, that was the crux of the, uh, the War of Independence and the formation of, of the United States. So the, the anxiety, the, you know, it's often said that one third of the people were loyal to the king, one third of the people wanted independence, and one third of the people just wanted to be left alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why there's that anxiety and, and even within the same family between Ambrose and John as to why one was very set on independence and why one didn't know if that was something that would, was really worth fighting for. So I think the book uh, amplifies and the series of the books uh, shows you what, what was worth fighting for and why independence was uh, something we wanted. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, that is something we kind of read this as a prelude to us getting into the actual American Revolution. So now they're going to get to start making their choices, loyalist, patriot, nutria, neutralist. And so the book has introduced a lot of concepts to us and um, on the front end of our learning about the American Revolution. Let's, let's do one more and then we'll wrap up. Okay, one more. So let's have Eli. Go ahead, Eli. Okay. How long did it take to write one page of the book? Oh, how long does it take to write one page? So yeah, one page, probably only taking you about two minutes. And then I had one little kiddo that wanted to know um, how long it, well, when you actually wrote it. When did you already tell us that? I can remember, but oh, when yeah. you so, actually write the book. So we wrote the, my dad's 96 right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we wrote him probably when he was in his early 80s, like around 83, 84 is when we started writing him. And um, he became a published author with me in 2015 when these books were published. Um, so the first two came out in 2015 and the third one came out last year. So... Yeah, so that's that's the time frame. It takes a long time for a book. Um, once a publisher um, buys it, um, it takes actually a couple of years for it then actually to come out based on their publishing lineup. Well, let's show our appreciation to the Sons of the American Revolution and Mr. Steed and his father for all the joy that they brought brought us and all the learning that they um, contributed to us. <laughs> and we thank y'all so much um we just really appreciate you being here and doing this for us and sharing your books with us oh my pleasure thank you so much thank you you. all right we'd like to thank uh, all of you guys and the um the cullens lake point uh elementary school for having us into your classroom today. Uh, This was a great experience for us. We're very excited to be there. And we know that the uh, Texas Sons of the American Revolution and your local chapters would be more than happy to come out and help you guys with any any other events, um, maybe with the uh, poster contest or some of the other things that we do with the SAR for schools. So we look forward to uh, working with you guys in the future. And thank you so much for your time today. And we're looking forward to that. Thank you so much for your support. Good job, bye. Thanks, everybody.